So in chapter 1, Jeremiah was appointed to be a prophet. We noted that he was called at a very early age. He was probably in his late teens when he was called. And he was called to a very difficult task because he would be taking God's word to a stubborn, a rebellious people, a people who had forsaken God, and a people who probably won't repent or turn. Uh, we'll find as we study Jeremiah that he is persecuted. There were death threats made against him. There were plots to kill him because people didn't like his message. He came across as negative. God's judgment would come. And people felt, well, that's a very bad message. We don't want to hear that. That may not be true. So they wanted to silence Jeremiah. But in Jeremiah chapter 2 now, we find his uh, first sermon as we have it here. Um, the word of the Lord comes to him and he communicates that to God's people. And so I've simply entitled the message, The Folly of Forsaking God. The folly, the foolishness of abandoning God. How wrong it is to turn away from God. And keep in mind, these people, they knew God. At one time, this nation was close to God. God had poured out his blessing. God was good to these people. God gave them great covenants and great promises. And now they're turning away. So let's read about how bad this is. We'll find as we study this passage that there were some things that contributed to this folly of turning away from God. They became ungrateful for God's blessings. They stopped fearing the Lord, and they just forgot about him. They just put him out of their mind. And so there's lessons for us to learn as well. So the folly of forsaking God, Jeremiah chapter 2. Let's notice number one. In the message that God gives to his people, God recalls their former love. God recalls a former time in which his people actually came after him. Despite all of their grumblings and complaining in the wilderness, God's people actually, actually called upon God. They asked God to save them and to help them, even though they grumbled and complained a lot when they came out of Egypt. Let's notice verses 1 to 3. So this is Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 1. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Go and cry in the hearing of Jerusalem, saying, Thus says the Lord. I remember you, the kindness of your youth, the love of your betrothal, when you went after me in the wilderness, in a land that was not sown. Israel was holiness to the Lord, the first fruits of his increase. All that devour him will offend, disaster will come upon them, says the Lord. So it seems like God is likening uh, the relationship to a marriage relationship. I remember the, the love of your youth when we were first married or during that betrothal period. You came after me. You sought me. You depended upon me. You looked to me. Despite all the grumblings and complaints the people had when they came out of Egypt, they still cried out to God and asked for his intervention, whether they needed water or whether they wanted food or whatever it was. They cried out to the Lord. Yes, there were many lapses in their faith, but God says, boy, back then you came after me, you loved me, you sought me. It says in verse 3 that Israel was holiness to the Lord. And uh, then we read that Israel was the first fruits of God in increase. In other words, it's like Israel was God's planting. Israel represented God's work. It's like, it's like a crop that God had planted. And, and, and Israel was, was the first fruits of that harvest, that work of God. So in other words, that's telling us God took delight in his people. God had joy in his people. Israel was God's pride and joy. And then we read in verse 3, all that devour him, that is to say, all that devour Israel, all that hurt Israel will offend. They'll offend God. And disaster will come upon them, says the Lord. So God was the protector of Israel. Anyone lifted up their hand or their finger against Israel, God would be there to devour them and punish them. God would protect and defend Israel, his people. So this sermon opens up with God just remembering and reflecting the former love, the former devotion of his people. Let's go to number two. Number two. So the people ended up despising God's goodness. And there's a lesson there for us. May we never despise God's goodness. May we never lose sight of God's goodness. And that's especially true for all of God's goodness that has come to us in Christ Jesus. 
You want to remain faithful to the Lord and faithful to the Lord just Jesus Christ. Just remember how good God is. Just remember how good Jesus our Savior is. Just remember the wonderful salvation we have in Christ and all the blessings that we have in Christ that will last forever and ever. Let's remember God's goodness. We have life and health and strength, and God has provided for our daily needs. We have family and friends. Yes, life is full of trouble and trials and difficulties and stresses and strains, but in the midst of it all, we see the wonderful goodness of God. Don't ever lose sight of God's goodness. So let's read this. This is now uh, verses 4 to 8. They despised God's goodness. They forgot about God's goodness. God's goodness didn't mean a whole lot. So notice letter A. I simply say God's goodness not valued. God's goodness was not valued. Let's start reading now in verse 4. Back to the word verse 4. Hear the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the families of the house of Israel. Thus says the Lord. What injustice have your fathers found in me, that they have gone far from me and have followed idols and have become idolaters? So God is asking that all-important question. Well, what fault did you find in me? What injustice? It's as if God is saying, did I treat you badly? Was there some, some big reason why you decided I wasn't good enough for you or, or I wasn't sufficient for you that you all decided to leave me and abandon me and go after other gods? So God's bringing up this question. He's trying to probe their minds and ask the why of it all. Why? Think about your actions. Think about your decisions. Why have you done what you've done? Why are you now worshiping idols? Verse 6. Neither did they say, where is the Lord? Who brought us up out of the land of Egypt? Who led us through the wilderness? Through a land of deserts and pits? Through a land of drought and the shadow of death? Through a land that no one has crossed and where no one dwells? I brought you into a bountiful country to eat its fruit and its goodness. But when you entered, you defiled my land and made my heritage an abomination. Did the priest not say, where is the Lord? And those who handled the law did not know me. The rulers also transgressed against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal and walked after things that do not prophesy. So God remembers how in time they started worshiping idols. God led them out of, uh, out of Egypt. He brought them through that wilderness, a very difficult place, a harsh place. And then God brought them into a land, a bountiful land, the text says, a land that's just, just overflowing with milk and honey, a, a land that was uh, very productive, full of uh, fruits and crops and things they could grow there, and just, just a wonderful land. But they didn't appreciate it. They didn't remain steadfast to God. So I say in letter B, well, notice the, the people didn't ask. This is mentioned two times. I believe it's mentioned in verse 6 and again in verse 8. The people didn't ask, well, where is the Lord? In other words, they weren't interested in God. They weren't interested in seeking God. They weren't interested in coming after him. They by and by just felt they had no use for God, and yet they forgot he was the one that brought them out of Egypt. He was the one that established them in the promised land. So that's all tragic. And notice the widespread corruption in verse 8. It's the priests. They didn't say, where is the Lord? The rulers transgressed, and the prophets prophesied by Baal. So that seems like the sum total of the leadership. The prophets, the priests, the rulers. It seems like everyone is against God. Everyone has turned from God. What a terrible and tragic situation. It didn't need to be this way, but it shows you human nature. Human nature is prone to lead God and forget about him. Well, let's go to number three. Forsaking God is irrational. Now God's going to point out how foolish their thinking is to lead God. Forsaking God is irrational. Think about all the blessings they had when they were with God. Serving him, loving him, enjoying him, praying to him, praising his name. Just saying, oh boy, all these gifts, Lord, they're from you. You gave all these things to me. We praise you. We thank you. We rejoice in you. Lord, we, we, we don't want to go anywhere. All these blessings come from you. Isn't that what the doxology says? That uh, brief hymn of pray, praise God from whom all blessings flow. Every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights with whom there's no variableness or shadow of turn. So let's read this section now. Verses 9 to 13. Notice verse 9. Therefore, I will yet bring charges against you, says the Lord, and against your children's children, I will bring charges. 
For past beyond the coast of Cyprus and sea, send to Kedar and consider diligently and see if there has been any such thing. Has a nation changed its gods, which are not gods, but my people have changed their glory for what does not profit. Let me just pause right there. Notice letter A. God was their glory. Notice how God is referred to here. Verse 11. But my people have changed their glory. And it's capitalized because that's a reference to God. They have changed their glory. What or who was the glory of God's covenant people, Israel? It was God. God was their glory. Because it was God who brought them out of Egypt. It was God who kept them safe and protected. It was God who fed them and nurtured them. It was God who brought them into the promised land. It was God who gave them that land, a land they didn't work for or earn or deserve. It was God who blessed them with all those good things in the promised land. It was God who made them a big and prosperous and powerful nation. It was God who blessed them abundantly above all the nations of the world. God was their glory. God was glorious. And God was their glory. Just like for us as Christians. What or who is our glory? It's God. God is our glory. God made me. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made, says David in Psalm 139. And God is the one who takes care of me. He feeds me. He clothes me. He helps me. He protects me. He delivers me. He's given me this wonderful salvation in Christ. It's all come from God. It's all God's grace. God is my glory. Jesus is my glory. A couple of cross references here. Keep your finger in Jeremiah 2. Don't lose your place. But if you will, go back to Deuteronomy 4. Deuteronomy 4. I want us to see what God's plan was as he was bringing his people out of Egypt into the promised land. God is making for himself a great nation, and God wants to use this nation, Israel, to be a witness unto himself. That people would come to know him. That people would realize how big and wonderful and glorious he is. So if we will, go to Deuteronomy, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy fifth book of the Old Testament, Deuteronomy chapter 4. Just a couple of verses here. Deuteronomy chapter 4. And this is God's instruction to his people. In Deuteronomy, God is preparing his people to enter the promised land. So God is going over all the expectations that God has for his people. He's reminding them what to do and what not to do. So now Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 6. Therefore, be careful to observe them. That is all my commandments, all the things that I'm going to teach you. Be careful to observe them, for this is what your wisdom and your understanding, what I must say of the peoples, who will hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has God, that's the Lord God Almighty, the true and the living God, for what great nation is there that has God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us, for whatever reason we may call upon him? And what great nation is there that has such statutes and righteous judgments as are in all this law which I have set before you this day? It's like God is encouraging his people to keep the law keep my commandments so that all the nations around will, will sit up and take notice and say, wow, this nation is special. This nation has a God, the true and the living God, that is really close to them. God takes care of them. God protects and provides and blesses. And, and this, this nation has all these wonderful laws and commandments to keep people safe and to prevent them from self-destructing. Wow. Israel was supposed to act in such a way as to show off God's glory and to draw attention to the glorious God that they served. Well, that didn't happen because by and by, they worshipped idols. Okay, there's a cross-reference in the New Testament I want you to see. So again, keep your finger in Jeremiah 2, but go to Luke chapter 2, if you will. Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. And this is actually part of the birth narrative of Jesus. We have read this at Christmas. <laughs> uh, Luke chapter 2. Remember now in Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 11 God is charging his people that they have changed their glory. They have changed and moved away from what is their glory and their glory is God. What makes the nation glorious is the God whom they serve. 
What makes them glorious is the God who brought them out of Egypt and takes responsibility for them because God is glorious. God is splendid. There's no one like God. So this is part of the uh, birth uh, narrative of Jesus where Simeon, Simeon takes Jesus up in his arms. And God had revealed to Simeon that he would not die, he would not depart from this life until he had seen the Lord's anointed. And it just so happened that Mary and Joseph were in Jerusalem and there around the temple complex. There was Mary and Joseph and there was Simeon. And Simeon then saw Mary and Joseph and he saw the baby and he picked up the baby in his arms. So notice now Luke chapter 2. And I'll just begin reading in verse 29. Luke chapter 2 verse 29. Lord, now let, uh, now, uh, and now, Lord, you are letting your servant, that would be Simeon, depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to bring revelation of the Gentiles, and what, and notice the end now, and the glory of your people, Israel. Jesus is the glory of God's people, because God made promises to his people. That through Abraham there would be a descendant in which all the families of the earth would be blessed. God made a promise to David. David, that would not cease to have a man sit in your throne who would rule and reign over your house uh, forever and ever. We read, that was read about it back in chapter uh, 1 of Luke. That promise is being fulfilled. God is our glory. Jesus is our glory. May it ever be so in our lives. May we never forget that truth. God is our glory. Uh, notice letter B, the people of Israel have been engaged in, and they have been engaged in action that does not profit. They are engaged in action that does not profit. Notice the very end of verse 11. Uh, it says there, but my people have changed their glory, that what, what it is that makes them so glorious, and it's God who makes them glorious. It's God who is glorious. For what does not profit? I don't know about you, but if I was doing something that had no profit or no benefit, I'd probably stop doing it. But God says to his people, look, at you're, you're, you're being foolish. You're, you're, you're turning away from me. You exchanged your glory for these useless, worthless idols and serving them. There is absolutely no profit. There's absolutely no benefit. And this is actually the second time God has brought this out. Notice back in verse 8. Back in verse 8, the very last statement of verse 8 says, and walked after things that do not profit. So God is reminding his people, why, why do you keep doing things that don't profit? Now let's get down to letter C. God is the fountain of living water. So now let's read verse 12. Notice verse 12. God says to the prophet, be astonished, O heavens, at this, and be horribly afraid. Be very desolate, says the Lord. Verse 13, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and have hewn themselves cisterns, <coughs> broken cisterns that hold no water. So notice how God is described. God is the fountain or spring of living waters. We might picture a spring uh, in the ground in which, which uh, spring water just comes bubbling up out of the ground. Just a constant supply of spring water just bubbling up and flowing. Clean, fresh spring water. Bubbling out of the ground nonstop. So that's the image of God. That's the picture of God providing and sustaining and caring his people uh, a, a very trustworthy, constant supply of water. I know we just go to the house and we turn the faucet on and we expect water to come out. But in the ancient world, people had to give a little thought to where their water was going to come from. And people always wanted to live near a supply of water. So that's God. God is the fountain of living waters. And then notice the contrast. God's people then have hewn themselves. In other words, they have to work for this. They have to go and work to hew themselves or, or build themselves cisterns. Cisterns. What is a cistern? A cistern could be a, a hole dug in rock to hold water, or it could be something that people built out of rock. They usually make the, the walls quite thick because you don't want water to seep through the rock. So the rock walls, sometimes the cisterns were round, they could be quite big and hold a lot of water. Sometimes the cisterns were rectangular. They might even be stairs going down into the supply of water. So what God is saying, I'm, I'm, the, I'm that constant, never-ending supply of all that you need. I'm all that you want. I'm sufficient for you. I'm that fountain, that spring of living waters, but you've turned away from me. And then you have to go out and build yourselves these cisterns 
to try to hold water, but these systems are broken. They're full of cracks, they're full of holes, and all the water leaks out. So you built for yourself cisterns, but they hold no water. That doesn't make sense, that's irrational. Why turn away from a constant supply of water? Fresh, clean water, a spring, a fountain just bubbling out of the ground. Why turn away from that to have to go out and build, build for yourself cisterns that don't hold any water? Reminds me of John 4. Turn, if you will, to John 4. Remember Jesus encountered the woman at the well? He was passing uh, through Samaria. And uh, he sent his disciples into town to buy food. And Jesus happened to stop by uh, a well. And there was a woman coming from the village to draw water. And Jesus has a conversation with her. This is John chapter 4. John chapter 4. So in John chapter 4, uh, let's just begin uh, reading in verse 9. John chapter 4, verse 9. So then the, the woman of Samaria said to Jesus, said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? Question mark. And notice that is a question mark. Jesus is trying to stimulate the thinking of this woman. And yes, the woman will come to understand that Jesus is greater than Jacob. Uh, verse 13, Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water, that's the water in the well, will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Yes, Jesus satisfies our soul's biggest needs and our deepest needs, and Jesus gives to us a satisfaction and a contentment that cannot be found in anyone else or anything else. And I can't help but think of the passage in John chapter 4 of Jesus talking to that woman at the well and saying to her, yes, if you drink the water that I'm going to give you, it will be in you a fountain, a a spring of water just bubbling up nonstop into eternal life. Now back to Jeremiah chapter 2, if you will. Back to Jeremiah chapter 2. So God challenges his people. Well, why? Why have you exchanged your glory? What does not profit? Why have you forsaken and abandoned the spring of water bubbling up into life? Uh, God gave them life. God sustains and protects and provides and delivers and rescues and blesses. Why have you turned from me and you built yourselves cisterns that hold no water? It's kind of like people who are trying to earn salvation on their works. They're building for themselves cisterns that hold no water. They're trying to develop a long list of good works that they think is going to get them into heaven. God says, no, I am that fountain of living water. They've hewn for themselves broken cisterns that hold no water. May we ever be faithful to God. May we ever trust in him. Let's go to the next point, point number four, moving right along here. Forsaking God has tragic consequences. So let's read the next paragraph. This would be verses 14 to 19. So let's look at this. Now God goes on and says, look it, you're on the wrong course. Uh, there's going to be tragic and terrible consequences to your actions. So verse 14 raises this question, is Israel a servant? Is he a home-born slave? No, he's not supposed to be. Remember, remember Israel was a servant, they, uh, a slave. They were in the land of Egypt, but God brought them out. God set them free. They were free people, and God was making them a free, independent nation. God would be their king. God would be their ruler, and God would lead them and love them and protect them and, and do everything for them. Is Israel a servant? Is he a home-born slave? No. Why is he plundered? Why is he being plundered? Why are people taking advantage of Israel? Why are they coming in to destroy and to ruin Israel? 
Why are they besieging its cities? Why are they knocking down its walls? Why are they wrecking havoc in God's people? Isn't Israel free? Yes, they were free. God made them free. But they're turning again to slavery. They are enslaving themselves to idols. How tragic. Notice verse 15. The young lions have roared and growled. They made his land waste. Uh, the young lions would be uh, uh, very fierce, uh, energetic lions. That would represent Israel's enemies. So the young lions roared at him and growled. They made his land waste. His cities are burned without inhabitant. Also the people of Noth and uh, Tapanes, that would be uh, places in Egypt, they have uh, broken the crown of your head. Have you not brought this on yourself? And that you have what? You have forsaken the Lord your God when he led you in the way. And now why take the road to Egypt to drink the waters of Shihor? Or take the road to Assyria to drink the waters of the river? In other words, don't go depend on Egypt. Don't go running to depend on Assyria. Don't go running to depend on these nations and try to strike up a deal and, and, and make them guarantee your security and your protection. You don't need Egypt. You don't need Assyria. All you need to do is turn back to the true and the living God, the fountain of living waters. Verse 19, your own wickedness will correct you and your backsliding will reprove you. Know, therefore, and see that it is an evil and bitter thing that you have forsaken the Lord your God. Yes. When you forsake God, the path ahead will always be full of calamity and tragedy and bitterness and misery. And that's what these people are experiencing. They already are experiencing it, and they will experience it even more so in the years ahead if they don't repent and turn from their sins. Notice the very end of verse 19, now that last sentence. And the fear of me, says God, the fear of me is not in you, says the Lord of hosts. These people just don't have any more reverence or respect for God they don't know God, they have forsaken God, they have put God out of their minds, and now they just have no reverence or respect for God. I pray that I would always respect God, that I would always revere him. And may as we study our Bibles and we learn about God, may we have greater reverence and respect for God. May we come to appreciate his greatness more than ever. One final point this morning, we don't have time to really study the whole chapter in detail, but one final point. One thing I noticed as I read through this chapter, I couldn't help but notice the people just think they don't need God. They just don't need him anymore. Notice verse 31. We'll just jump down to verse 31. Verse 31. We'll just look at these two verses here, 31 and 32. So God says to his people, oh, generation, see the word of the Lord. In other words, just pay attention to God's word. Pay attention to its commandments, to its promises, to its judgments. Just, just get back to the word. Read the word and, and be moved by God's authoritative message to you. O oh, generation, see the word of the Lord. Have I been a wilderness to Israel or a land of darkness? Question mark. And the answer is no. God has not been a wilderness to Israel or a land of darkness. God has been just the opposite. God has been pouring out his blessing and his bounty. God has been generous with Israel. He has given them light and life. He brought them out of that land of darkness. He brought them out of Egypt. He brought them into the promised land. He gave them what they did not work for, earn, or deserve. He gave them a wonderful and beautiful country. God has been anything but darkness to his people. He's been anything but a wilderness. He's been just the opposite. So God asked that question, have I been a wilderness to you? Have I been darkness to you? And the answer is no, absolutely not. Then God says, why do my people say, we are lords, we will come to you, God, we will come to you no more. We're lords. We, we, we feel we're all self-sufficient. We're masters, we're rulers, we're governors. We, we can manage it ourselves. We don't need you anymore, God. How can they even get to that point? They have forgotten their history. They have forgotten what God has done for them. They have forgotten God's goodness. And then more questions are asked in verse 32 to sort of drive the point home how badly these people have forgotten God and put God out of their minds. God says in verse 32, Can a virgin forget her ornaments or a bride her attire? A woman on her wedding day isn't going to forget to get dressed up now, is she? That, that, that just won't happen. <laughs> on the wedding day, the woman will be all dressed up and beautiful. Can a virgin forget her ornaments or a bride her attire? No, no way. Yet, yet, it seems almost unbelievable, yet my people have forgotten me days without number. They have forgotten God. They have forsaken God. 
They have no reverence for God. They have despised God's goodness. And now they just don't remember God. They are not actively and conscientiously keeping God in their thoughts. And they're not keeping an accurate picture or understanding of God in their thoughts. Lots of lessons for us here. May we never forsake God. May we realize for us believers that God is our wellspring. He is the spring or the fountain of living waters. He gives us everything we need. He's the source of all blessing. Let me just close with a hymn. I think of the words, I need thee. In Jeremiah's day, the people came to think they don't need God anymore. Somehow they came to think they needed all those false gods and all those idols. And somehow they, they thought all those idols and all those false gods were going to do something for them that God couldn't or wouldn't do for them and how, how, how mistaken they were. But just hear the words of these hymns as I close. I need thee every hour, most gracious Lord. No tender voice like thine can peace afford. I need thee every hour, stay thou nearby. Temptations lose their power when thou art nigh. I need thee every hour, in joy or pain. Come quickly and abide, for life is vain. I need thee every hour, most holy one. O oh, make me thine indeed, thou blessed son. I need thee, I need thee. Oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to thee. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for your word. And we thank you for all the lessons we learned from your people recorded for us in the Old Testament. Lord, help us to love you with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. Help us to stay close to you. Help us to remember all of your gifts, all of your blessings. Help us to remember your grace. Help us to remember all the benefits of our wonderful salvation we have in Christ that will last forever. Lord, give us an ever-deepening respect and reverence for who you are. May with each passing day we love you more. And Lord, may we never forget you. Help us to always keep you in our minds, and as we keep you in our minds, and as we trust in you, and as we depend upon you, and as we show every day, Lord, that we need you, may you fill our lives with joy and peace. Lord, you are our joy and delight. Lord, you are our glory. Jesus, our Savior, is our glory. We thank you, Lord, for all that you are, and all that you have done for us, and all that you will do for us throughout eternity. We pray this in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. May God bless his word to all of you this morning.